Hi, Hub listeners. Roger Griffiths here, the executive director of The Hub. Welcome to this, a special presentation of The Hub Dialogues. As some of you may know, I wear from time to time another hat. I'm the chair of something called The Monk Debates, which is a Canadian charity that sets about to create some civil and substantive debates and conversations on the big topics of the day. As part of my monk debate role, I recently had the opportunity to catch up with independent U.S. journalist Matt Taibbi. You may know Matt from his storied career at Rolling Stone magazine, and maybe more recently from his incredible exposés about Twitter. These were the result of something called the Twitter Files, a whole series of documents that uh, new CEO and owner Elon Musk released to a select group of independent journalists, including Matt Taibbi. I just sat down recently with Matt for a far-ranging conversation on the state and future of Twitter, mainstream media, the future of our democracy going into the 2024 election cycle. We caught up with him after his storied performance on the Monk Debate stage last November, where he debated the motion, be it resolved, mainstream media can't be trusted. He won that debate with Douglas Murray by an overwhelming margin. Does he still think that mainstream media has a future? What about independent media in an age when Twitter and Substack are going to war with each other? We've got all those insights and more in this special conversation with Matt Taibbi. I hope you enjoy it. Matt Taibbi, welcome. Thanks for having me, Roger. Well, great to be back in conversation with you. Um, we m- met in person and had a, a wonderful evening together at Roy Thompson Hall, uh, late November 2022, when you were on stage for our mainstream media debate. Little did we know, Matt, that that was a pretty crazy week for you. Um, you were spinning a whole bunch of pie plates and more than just appearing on our stage alongside Malcolm Gladwell up against um, him and uh, Michelle Goldberg from the New York Times with Douglas Murray as your sparring partner. Why don't you just, as a kind of to open up this conversation with our Monk listeners, why don't you just remind us what was happening that week and what you suddenly got pulled into, literally the moment you got off the monk stage at Roy Thompson Hall? <laughs> um, well, th- thanks for the question. Yeah, uh, that week, uh, it was the end of November 2022. Um, I got a, a direct message on Twitter, basically asking me if I would like to dig into the um, the internal memoranda and emails of the uh, of Twitter. Uh, and in fact, I think you asked the question on stage about that because Elon Musk had mentioned something about material coming out uh, that week. And I had to kind of, you know, play it cool and pretend I didn't know what, what, what that was about. I actually deflected the question to Douglas, but I already knew that I was headed to San Francisco um, right after the debate. Uh, and then I, I was going to have, you know, a few days to do the first story um i hadn't actually looked at any of the material yet but basically the debate um i i found out just before the debate that the twitter files was going to happen and matt you know as a journalist how did you approach this opportunity because it's a pretty unique circumstance you have this company that's been acquired by elon musk it's in a sense been taken private um he clearly has an, an agenda uh that he wants to push how did you engage with him? What, what were the kind of parameters? Uh, and how did you how did you feel in the end okay with putting yourself into the kind of lion's den here with this very sensitive information? We would go into that in a sec that really, you know, exploded across the mainstream media in the ensuing weeks. Yeah, that's a good question too, because um, I think this is a, it was a unique situation, probably ethically uh, in, in journalism. There were so many different moving parts uh, involved, so many different questions that there really wasn't an analog for. So I, I asked a lot of people for advice about this, but basically, you know, you have a CEO who's coming forward. He's very wealthy, uh, very powerful person um, at the time, the richest man in the world. 
and uh, wants to share uh, the internal correspondence of one of the world's most powerful companies. And, you know, you're told that you're going to have basically free reign to look at anything you want, that you can enter any search terms you want. Um, the, the only condition that I was asked to agree to, um, well, one was an attribution, and, which was just sources of Twitter. And the other one was that the material had to come out on Twitter first, uh, which I was fine with. I mean, I, I think um, as long as my subscribers were okay with it, and they were uh, for the most part, um, uh, I thought it was worth it. Uh, after that, I thought the test was, you know, once I started to see the material, the, the test was, you know, is this stuff true? Can it be confirmed? Um, are these self-contained news stories? You know, I think what I decided I was going to do was, was that I was only going to run material that I could independently confirm somehow uh, and that by itself was a news story so, so that there wasn't going to be some kind of additional context um, that would come out that would completely change the uh the nature of the stories so for instance you know we found uh emails about a communication route between twitter and the fbi and the dhs um and how that worked leading up to the 2020 elections no matter what else came out if there was another side to that story um this what we were putting out was still true uh and it was at least part of a story so that's what we tried to do. It got more complicated as time went on. Um, and that ultimately is what I think sank the project is that there were just too many different um, issues uh, that were too difficult for all the parties to balance at the same time. But uh, for a while, it was it was unique. Yeah. And again, just the serendipity, let's frame it in the positive, leaving that monk debate stage, be it resolved, you know, don't trust mainstream media. And then as an independent journalist, getting kind of shoehorned into what became, you know, the biggest story, I think, to close out, you know, 2022. How did you respond uh, to, I'm just thinking, you know, the mainstream media rebuttal, which would be, hey, we're the New York Times. We've got an editorial staff of, I don't know, what is it? 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 journalists. You know, we're, we're equipped to deal with this. We have the depth in the bullpen and the resources to handle this. You're, a, you're an independent investigative journalist out on your own with Substack and, you know, great network and contacts. But how did you kind of push back, Matt, against that argument that really this was or should have been a job for a big incumbent media player who could have brought all those different resources to the table? Well, again, I, I think um, under normal circumstances, absolutely, that's what you, you would expect. But the, the subject of the monk debates, I think, answers that question. Um, Elon Musk, I think, very intentionally chose only independent journalists. I think he was trying to make a point about... Um, not only about how he felt about mainstream uh, journalism, but also I think there was a, an element of he wanted the material to be believed um, and there was going to be an issue if, if it was farmed out to the Washington Post and the New York Times and they did what they would do. I mean, I think one, one can predict how they would cover a story like that when he, he handed the ball off to people like me and Michael Schellenberger and Barry Weiss and the other people who eventually became involved. It was actually pretty unpredictable from his point of view. That was one of the things that I liked about this project is that, um, you know, he didn't really have any idea where this was going. The company didn't really know. And um, I thought that was, that was a more interesting story uh, if you didn't know in advance what the, what the narrative was going to be coming out of it. Um, so yeah, the, and, and also when the, when the material started to come out as an, as an investigative reporter, what you're always hoping when you do, you know, a story that has some kind of explosive material in it is that the cavalry is going to come and other journalists will come and start digging themselves and find new angles and, and, you know, 
advance the story forward. But that's exactly what didn't happen with the Twitter files. Instead, they turned on us and turned us into the story and really just attacked the idea of releasing any of this material. And I think that, you know, that there's your answer for why the New York Times and the Washington Post weren't given this story because they didn't want it. Uh, really, they didn't want it unless they could completely control it. Mm -hmm. Fair point. What do you think about Matt, all those documents that you went through and that you looked at, what, what would be the big takeaway from the information that you had access to? What kind of concerned you the most? If you're going to put all that together into, you know, a, an expression of public interest, like what, what went wrong? And we can talk about solutions later, but I just first want to understand what you think the Twitter files exposed in terms of an urgent problem that somehow at some point we're going to have to figure out. I think the most um, ex explosive stuff had to do with the relationship between these tech platforms and uh, agencies like the FBI, the DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, um, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, uh, internationally, where, you know, we have a story coming out just in, in today about um, some Twitter files material about the Australian intelligence agencies talking to Twitter. We saw it from, you know, all over the world. There were these enforcement agencies funneling these massive amounts of um, content moderation requests to these these companies, and not just Twitter, like a whole bunch of these these firms uh and this was done in a way that was increasingly formalized with time like there was a uh, we worked pretty hard to figure out what the formal line of communication was between all those actors in the united states was um i think that's very concerning because I've, i think people until recently had this idea that they were looking at some kind of organic representation of reality when they went on social media now we're finding out that it's sort of exquisitely stage managed that they can dial up the engagement for one account all the way up to everybody sees it and another account all the way down to zero and that can be done at the behest of a government and so there's a lot of issues that are very troubling and haven't really been discussed publicly so i, th I think all those things are very important matt do you have a sense of why Twitter pre Elon Musk was just so accommodating to, and we can talk a little bit about it, not just intelligence agencies, but in a sense, political actors within the white house, uh, within mainline political parties is it, did you ever get a sense? Is this some kind of dance between the threat or specter of regulation or what social media platforms would argue is over regulation versus access? Are they kind of trading on, okay, we're going to scratch the back of your national intelligence agency, but, you know, nod, nod, wink, wink. There's a deal here. There's a quid quo pro. I'm just trying to understand where you think, having looked at all these documents, where the impetus, the rationale for Twitter to do this, because as you say, it's such a, it's such a distortion of the, of the public image that they project, the sense of a digital public square of authentic conversation and dialogue um i mean they must have known that they were running a risk absolutely um it, it's funny in august of 2017 we saw that twitter had received um had been forwarded a paper written by an academic from notre dame named danielle citron and it was about uh censorship creep and the paper basically detailed the history of how uh, tech platforms like Twitter, uh, Facebook, and Google had been increasingly pressured to um, accept more and more uh, government content moderation requests, uh, culminating in 2015 and 2016 when after bombings, terrorist bombings in Brussels and Paris, uh, all of the uh, companies got together and they signed, I forget what it was called. It was, it was like a, an agreement about hate speech that sort of formalized certain rules about uh, content release and 
increased the government's role and having a say in what, what went online. This pattern, you know, uh, was repeated in the United States. The, one of the reasons they were circulating that paper is because at that exact time, the Senate Intelligence Committee in the U.S. was putting a lot of pressure on Twitter to provide research about Russian bots and come up with certain kinds of numbers about how many Russian bots there had been on their platform. And that was the carrot. They were, they were asked to, to produce something. The stick was that there was this threat of re regulation and taxation that was coming, um, you know, sort of at the same time. And Twitter understood this implicitly. I tried to sort of show that in a couple of the reports that this was what was going on internally. The company was very worried about um, this increased regulation. And you saw at first they, they did not want to be partners with the government in 2017. There, there was a lot of internal tension about this, but within two or three years, it, they'd given up. And essentially they, they had embraced the idea of becoming full fledged partners with, uh, the government with civil society organizations uh, and even the news media in this kind of subterranean content moderation scheme that's just very complicated and um i think it's not where they were intellectually you know silicon valley was in a very different place 10 years ago now they're in this other place and and that was what we were seeing seeing in the documents i think one of the things maybe that surprised people the most or at least surprised me was the extent to which you know, political appointees, political actors were, had these special lines of communication into Twitter and were able to, if not, as you say, pull down content, turn those dials on content based on perceived public policy objectives of the government of the day, particularly, uh, the white house. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And, and again, did, did Twitter try to draw any lines between, let's say, okay, a national security agency, maybe that has, I don't know, some rationale that there is a an analyst who's not a politician, who's not a political appointee, who thinks that this information is dangerous or causing public harm versus, you know, a politician or a political appointee pursuing, a, you know, a narrow partisan interest and then foisting that interest in a sense onto the platform to respond to they did they did differentiate absolutely and that was one of the really interesting subplots of you know the documents or at least what we could glean from them um the twitter executives in particular the trust and safety department um which was led by a guy named yoel roth uh they were very um, skeptical, for instance, of the State Department's Global Engagement Center, which was a new agency. They didn't like those folks a lot. There were some um, there were some academic um, agencies that were connected to the House Intelligence Committee that they were very skeptical about. There were some think tanks they really didn't like. Um, there were some politicians that they, you know, internally were very um, they were very exhausted with having to deal with with certain members of Congress who had a lot of requests. Uh, there was some humor when you know there there was one senator who sent like a a list with you know a gigantic Excel spreadsheet with three hundred names on it, basically saying, "Can you take all these down?" I mean, it wasn't that overt, but it was essentially what the ask was. But yes, there was a sliding scale of of trust. They they had a lot more um, uh, belief and faith in the FBI uh, and Homeland Security. Those were the two agencies that they they felt confident in. And in the end, they settled on this system, which I thought was really interesting. Which was, if the agencies they didn't like had a request, as long as it came through the FBI or the DHS, they would accept it. And this was sort of the big bargain that everybody came to in the end, which I thought was kind of fascinating, Machiavellian, cynical. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's so many different ways to look at that um, and parse that. It, 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 it's just, the, it, but yes, absolutely. They, they were trying to distinguish it, but as time went on, you see those wrinkles were getting smoothed out. Um, and yeah, that, that, that was very interesting.
thank you for this fascinating stuff. And just to hear it from you, having done all the hard work at the coal face to try to extract the key information, it's just uh, invaluable to have this conversation with you, Matt. So let's talk about what happened with your relationship with Elon Musk and, and Twitter, because what initially started out as a very uh, seemingly open, transparent, as you say, kind of hands-off attitude that uh, Elon Musk and the new kind of Twitter took to this, that relationship began clearly to to sour. What what went on there? What happened? And and then we can talk about where things ended up. Well, I don't know fully all the answers to those questions because I only know my side of the story. When you know, when I when I entered into the agreement to do um, this work and I wasn't involved in conversations with the other reporters. I mean, we didn't go as a group to talk to uh, anybody at Twitter. It, the, all these uh, arrangements sort of happened separately. Um, I mentioned before that normally when somebody comes to you with a story, you always want to understand what they want to get out of press coverage because uh, you, you don't want there to be misunderstandings down the road. And it's also important for your understanding of what the material is. Um, you know, why is this person coming forward? What does this material mean to them? You know, um, and I, I can't say that I ever fully completely grasped what the thinking was from the Twitter side. But as soon as I started seeing the material, I thought it doesn't matter. Like this stuff is so explosive. Um, you know, just as purely as a news phenomenon, the, the mode of question, I think we can sideline that for now. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to try to get as much as I can and see how much um, information there is to be gleaned from this. And I'll worry about all that later. Uh, in hindsight, I, I, I do think that was the right move. Um, but maybe there might have been a way to, to do things differently so that you know, we could have extended the project a little bit more, but I, but I, from the very beginning, thought the priority was get as much stuff as you can, because the public is curious about it. Uh, but over time, you know, they, they started to become unhappy. I'm not really fully sure what that was all about. Um, did, did they express what the unhappiness was about? Was it about the, the knock on effects of how Twitter was being covered? Do you, I mean, as you say, they, they went into this seemingly eyes wide open. They knew what this information was. So did they expect something else to have happened as a result of these disclosures? I don't know. I mean, I, clearly there were negative consequences uh, for them for doing the story. I think there were advertiser boycotts. I don't know whether they were directly tied to the Twitter files, but I'm sure it didn't help. Um, there were probably all sorts of people in government who weren't happy um with this stuff hap you know going on uh there were relationships that had to be strained uh as a result of this reporting there were people people still at the company um whose names were coming out in some of these emails and that had to be stressful internally uh you know, Elon was meeting with people like John Podesta, who, you know, was one of the subjects of some of these stories. So um, it had to be difficult in, in a lot of different levels that I didn't hear about. And I thought, I also thought it what really, I didn't want to ask about, frankly, um, you know, that that was on them. Um, if they, you know, they had a problem with this, or this was creating problems internally, um, all that meant, as far as I understood, was that this project was probably going to be finite. It wasn't going to go on forever. Uh, but the the more concrete issue that we eventually ran into, which was a dispute between uh, Substack and uh, Twitter, and I don't even know the full story there, but what happened was they, you know, we woke up one morning and the Substack links weren't being shared on Twitter or, or they were being throttled down. And you know, I, because I'm a Substack contributor, that was a major problem for me. And I, I, Elon and I kind of had a, you know, difference of opinion about that. And uh, that, that was it. I was out of the project at that point.
You're one click away from getting access to all the Hub's best analysis and insights. Visit our website, www.thehub.ca now and sign up for our weekly email news digest. Every Saturday morning, we'll send to your inbox the cutting edge thinking and analysis of our smartest contributors on the week that was. Dive in to the big issues and ideas moving the public conversation, courtesy of The Hub. Again, you can grab that exclusive email newsletter right now, free of charge at www.thehub.ca. Now back to our program. Yeah, so again, this is fascinating because it, in the end, the breakup seemed to somehow happen not because of the Twitter files, but because of some perceived maybe threat that Twitter felt Substack represented because Substack had made some internal changes in terms of how its content was being presented that could be said to be Twitter-like. I mean, is this just as simple as, I don't know, a kind of commercial dispute that then escalated and had collateral effects, which was you were out of the project, the kind of Twitter files to, to a large extent kind of wound down. Yeah, on the surface, that's the explanation. Um, maybe that's what it really was. I don't know. Uh, but it felt a little abrupt to me. I mean, um, but, I, you know, I went to Elon with a question at one point and basically said, and I'm only disclosing this because he did, uh, you know, what would you have me do? I mean, if I'm, I'm at Substack, you know, um, I can't really continue doing this. And, and this, I mean, just for people to understand, I mean, this is how you make your living as a journalist. So when links are not being shared on Twitter and you're doing all this work on the Twitter files, you're in a sense, well, not that you're uncompensated, but that you're, you have a way to make a living and that living in a sense is now being threatened by the person and the company that then brought you into this partnership. I mean, I'll just speak for you, Matt. It, it sounds a bit abusive. Like it, it was just, a little weird. I mean, yeah, yeah, especially since since the implication of the Twitter files was that you know we're being advocates for free speech, and um, but this was kind of a violation of sort of basic net neutrality ideas, right? And um, I, I didn't even I, I I did not see this coming. I, I didn't even think of it as a potential problem, and when it did come. Um, and when I asked, well, what, what, what should I do about this? The answer was, well, come and be a subscriber at Substack, uh, at, uh, at Twitter, you know, because Twitter was developing this sort of Substack like feature. And I thought that would be a disaster because we're already getting killed. Um, you know, every time I, I turned on the internet, I was being accused of, of being a lap dog for Elon Musk, which again, I thought it was worth it. Uh, I was willing to take as much abuse as possible for this material, but this was kind of a bridge too far. I mean, I can't go and, you know, have a financial relationship with the company, especially if I've already seen that they're willing to, you know, mess with the content and, and, you know, throttle it up or down. And, and, um, and so that, that was just, I, I thought I was trying to protect the story and he didn't see it that way. And, you know, we just sort of went in opposite directions, but tellingly it hasn't, the, the project hasn't continued with other reporters really since then. I mean, there, there's been a few things, but um, you know, I, I don't really know what's going on there. Yeah. And where's the dispute right now between Twitter and Substack? I mean, it's again, that seemed to kind of come up as like, in the news cycle and then it's kind of disappeared and, and from what i can see there's lots of Substack links on twitter and vice versa i guess i don't know it's all conjecture but it is amazing and and here i kind of salute elon musk you know this guy is exposed to so much regulation across so many of his businesses right if you think of his solar panels, his cars, SpaceX. If they're if the government ever wanted to tighten a screw on somebody, they probably have a million pressure points to make him feel some some pain. Not on Twitter, but on one of his other related businesses. So in some ways it always I find it remarkable when these people that are so exposed 
in a sense, to the pressures that, you know, vested interests, especially in the state, can bring to bear on you, and then they still go ahead and do these things. There's something very courageous to it. But at the end of at the end of the day, I, I also remind myself that these are people that are very exposed, that have these complex relationships with the state on a whole bunch of other files that are pretty important to them. Yeah, it's very difficult to know, you know, who's pressuring them him to do what. I mean, I, that's one of the reasons that you're exactly right. I, at the very beginning of the project, I thought, this is incredible. Like, who else would do this? Um, he's either crazy or incredibly interesting or, you know, a combination of those things. Um, if I were his lawyer, I would, you know, I, I don't even know what I would do. Like the, the idea of having this, you know, journalist just roaming free in, in an office and looking through all your files and, just, you know, think about all the liability issues that could come up as a result of something like that. Being indifferent to that, to the degree that he appeared to be was, was amazing to watch. So I'm totally in agreement with you. But the this dispute with Substack is not as I don't think it's a small thing. It may be a small thing financially because Substack's not really a competitor to Twitter in any real way. I mean, at least not yet. Uh, I don't I don't I don't see that happening. But it is a place where it's one of the last sort of bastions of um, you know independent media where there's a whole bunch of kind of non mainstream uh, journalists in this on this one platform and a lot of those people were were very ardent supporters of you know the new twitter and elon musk and all that and they're still kind of being throttled on the platform i mean Mm -hmm. you know i'm getting complaints all the time from substack writers about how uh, difficult things are and you know i don't know i don't know what to think about that uh if if you're if your approach to business ends up resulting in you know, this kind of a impact on independent media. I mean, how are we to interpret that? It's, it's a difficult thing. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because that's what I wanted to go with you next. Cause you were back on stage. I'm thinking back to November on our debate on mainstream media. And at that time in that debate, you were good at alighting my questions. Now I understand why, but we, I was trying to understand and help the audience understand, like where did Twitter fit on that spectrum itself? Right. And, I think we all, because of Musk's own seeming commitment to free speech and then the action, as you say, of creating the Twitter Files project, it it seemed definitively non-mainstream. But, you know, following the dispute with Substack, the extent to which the Twitter Files gets shut down, I don't know, Matt, it, it seems like Twitter's evidencing some of those negative characteristics that have that we know in, from how mainstream media behaves, a kind of, you know, a, a group think, a monopolistic view of information in the, in the public square. Um, do you have a feeling that that's somehow happened, that there's been some kind of shift in Twitter over the last six months as we, as this company really does struggle through a very difficult period? I don't know. I It's, it's difficult to say because, again, I'm not really privy to what the financial pressures are and what the solutions to those pressures might be. But um, clearly the old Twitter had evolved into something that was sort of massively uh, enhancing the visibility of traditional mainstream press at the detriment of uh, independent media. And that was also going on at Facebook and and especially Google. I think Google was probably worse um, than the other two platforms in this respect. But uh, yes, and when Musk came on, I think there was a lot of hope among independent journalists that we're finally going to be allowed to be on an even playing field. And that's kind of what it felt like for a while. I mean, the Twitter files felt like a blow back in that direction. And then you started to get these criticisms from uh, certain quarters about how the Twitter files are a limited hangout. It's it it's something that looks like it's rebellious, but actually it really isn't. It's it's a setup. Um, you know, I n- I never really saw it that way, uh, but here I am on the outside now, right? So um, you know, I tried to play this as down the line as I could, and doing that uh, 
proved not to be viable in the long run. So um, what does that tell you? I, I, I think, I think it's, you know, the answer to your question is somewhere in between. I mean, Twitter is my conclusion at the end of the day with all this stuff is that whenever you have owners with these platforms, no matter what happens in uh, eventually there's going to be, you know, thumbs on the scale in some direction or another. And there's just no avoiding that. And, and pe some people are going to have their speech suppressed and others are going to have it amplified and there's nothing you can do about it unless you have kind of a suppression resistant mechanism, like a protocol, like email. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I don't know a way around it. Yeah, no. And I just think it's, you know, corporations will behave like corporations and, you know, they're self-interested, they're often aggressive, and um, they like to acquire stuff, they like to dominate, and often those values are, they're hard to reconcile with, as you say, the more freewheeling, open, you know, discourse that is what we hope, the kind of foundations of a, you know, a democratic society that is in fact uh, free and open. Just in our remaining moments, Matt, I want to just talk to you because we'll catch up again from the debate six months ago. You know, I say this with no relish at all, but I have a feeling that, you know, the mainstream media has really struggled over this last period. There's seems to be a, almost a kind of narrowing of what is tolerated as conventional thinking and opinion. And it goes, you know, the Twitter files was part of that and the blowback that you got. But, uh, you know, all the re revelations that have come up around the so-called Russia gate and the extent to which you know, that really does look like disinformation, not peddled by Russians, but peddled by, you know, a domestic U.S. political actor and, you know, his or her political party. We now have, you know, again, serial denials seemingly in mainstream media around, um, you know, the Hunter Biden and the revelations that have come out of the U.S. Congress of wire transfers and bank accounts and millions of dollars flowing to individual members of the Biden family. But I don't know, Matt, it's so frustrating. All this seems so hived off. It seems like, you know, there's one set of media outlets that cover these types of things with relish, maybe sometimes with, you know, too much innuendo and uh, speculation. And then a lot of the rest of the mainstream met press, which is hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. It's, it's a bizarre circumstance uh, we find ourselves in, I think, going into the 2024 U.S. presidential election. I totally agree. I think I think you really nailed it. It's not a pleasant development. I mean, I'm an independent journalist and I want the mainstream media to succeed. I think it ne it needs to. Uh, you know, the countries are not healthy um, if they don't have a functioning mass media. And nobody believes them. And I think increasingly that's kind of the problem is there's this uh, lingering, worsening trust issue that can only be addressed by uh, dealing with, you know, some of the factual issues. And you talk about the Russia story. There was that massive Columbia Journalism Review expose, 24,000 words. That's a lot of errors to, to you know, address. Uh the Twitter files, you know, expose a few of those things. Um, there's the Hunter Biden story. And the, 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 the thing with that is not even so much whether or not that story was important or whether it was terribly damning. It was more the behavior of the media during that story that was really troubling. You know, not just turning a blind eye to it being uh, suppressed, but also, as we found out, you know, planning these what they call a tabletop exercise to, to, you know, how do you, how should we all respond when this story comes out? Um, that is a terrible look for media, right? Because we should never be on the side of people, politicians who are planning for a negative story. That's just so strange. So I, I, I think these corporate media organizations are stuck because they, they have an audience that, and they know how to retain some semblance of it, but those techniques that they've used to retain that audience have gotten them into so much trouble um, that, you know, the, the, the trend that you've talked about in the last six months, is only going to get worse, I think, until, 
we've seen it buzzfeed vice i mean you know the, these big companies are sort of disappearing and i um i think it's going to lead to kind of a rethink of how corporate media works mm -hmm. so this is critical because you're helping me because i've really i've struggled to think well why are they behaving this way like why would they this kind of shutting down not simply of debate but the shutting down of the the conveyance of information that is in fact a factual like this is verified information you saw the emails and the memos they exist as a physical record the the house committee you may think the house republicans are insane but they have from the treasury department you know factual records of bank trend you know bank transactions and and shell companies and and yet it's it's as if the information itself isn't even flowing um, from, from legitimate sources into the press. And I don't, is it to protect the audience, Matt? Is that, is it they worry they're going to lose audience if they're exposed to, you know, alternative facts that don't conform to their theory of, you know, how the world is? I don't know. I, I just struggle to think of how journalists can sit there and just ignore facts i mean isn't that the whole purpose of journalism to address facts to take them seriously to spend the time and effort to verify them and then bring them to the public so the public can make up their own mind you would think that would be the purpose of it um but i think the and they took what was a, uh, i think a relatively simple job i mean the model you you just explained which is we get a bunch of facts we sort of figure out what they are we give them to the audience and then it's up to them to kind of deal with it. Uh, that's a, I mean, that's a hard job because you got to do all the confirming and all the phone calls, but conceptually it's not that difficult, but they, they massively complicated it by creating this new uh, revenue model, which is, you know, this sort of audience optimization form of media where you're you've trained an audience to expect a certain narrative and to expect that they're going to be told a story that is consistent uh, on a day-to-day -day basis the republicans are the bad guys the democrats are the good guys and that's the angle at w from which we're going to approach everything more or less right from certain media organizations so even the story you're just talking about with you know the house committee and the financial transactions the New York Times did that story. They got a lot of those facts in the story. But if you look at the headline, it's something like House Committee Finds No Wrongdoing, right? By, by President Biden. Right, yeah. But that's not the point. There's 11 family members, including grandchildren, that have received hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of dollars of cash transfers. Yeah, but they, they clearly felt pressure to present the information some other way. And... And look, they're making a lot of money with, with subscriptions. They have the largest subscriber base in the world, I think. And so that works for them on some level. But at the same time, while you're doing that, you're also alienating this, but you know, other potential audience base. And I think it's It has this downstream effect uh, where people eventually they start comparing notes and, and there reach, reaches a critical mass for audiences. Just even the ones that like you, they, they stop kind of believing in you deep down inside. And that's that's a terrible place for the press to be. I mean, when, once you lose trust, it's over. I mean, it, it's like a run in a bank. I mean, it, 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 it gets wiped out in a second. So yeah, I, I don't know where they go from here, but it's, it's, it is difficult. So just in our final question here, looking forward to the upcoming presidential electoral cycle in 2024, what do you think happens? Um, is it just as you say, this declining trust, um, a public square that's either rife with disinformation or the absence of facts because people are living in these hermetically sealed truth bubbles, I don't know, on either side of the ide ideological or cultural divide. And then independent journalists, uh, you know, as you say, a lot of them at Substack increasingly under pressure from possibly, you know, predatory, you know, marketing practices by the the platforms, I don't know, Matt, it starts to get pretty, pretty grim here. Like, <laughs> like what, 
what the heck? I mean, do we just go to chat GPT and like punch in, I don't know, tell, tell me what the uh, weather is today and be happy with that? That's a whole separate discussion because they, uh, we'll have to talk about that one another time. But yeah, no, the, the, this fragmenting, this chaos, it's, I think it's very difficult and very stressful for, for people to look at the, the information landscape and see so many choices and not know who to, whom to trust. I, it, when you talk about the election, I remember when I first started, you know, working in the U.S. for kind of big time mainstream journalism, one of my first jobs was traveling around following the, the John Kerry campaign. And it was amazing to watch because you would sit in a room with 20 journalists and these were the people who were basically deciding who was going to be pre president. They would sit around and talk about which candidates were, um, what was the word they used, uh, electable or viable. And then they would sort of snort at the other ones. And those were the ones who would get bad coverage. And they had so much authority um, with audiences. And there were there was so little comparatively alternative media. Remember, this was at, at the time when in, um, alternative newspapers were dying in big cities so now they it was like they had a monopoly everywhere uh it's been completely reversed that that entire situation is gone even that phenomenon of campaign journalists um you know thinking that they have a say in how people vote that's been exposed and people are wise to it and audiences are very very attuned to how things are covered on the campaign trail so it becomes very difficult to sort out who's going to win, who has a chance, what polls do you believe? I mean, it, it's it, it's the Wild West right now. I mean, even in the middle of it, I don't understand it. So it's, I don't know how ordinary people deal with it now. Yeah. Well, I think one solution is to read you on Substack. And, uh... <laughs> Great, I love it. Thank you. No, seriously, Matt. I mean, there's a few people that I think uh, have your kind of uh, intestinal fortitude and intellectual courage to genuinely be independent. And uh, you'd be the first to admit, no one gets it right all the time, but it's it's the ethos that you approach your work and the kind of public spiritedness which you've asserted your own journalism and the role of independent journalism in society today. It's critical. It's a, you're, you're a rare bird, Matt, so we always like having you here and making people aware of uh, the important work that you're doing. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. I wish my mother could hear that. Uh, <laughs> thanks so much. I really appreciate it. And um, uh, thanks for having me on. Hey, thanks for your time today. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Hub Dialogues, brought to you by The Hub, Canada's leading source for analysis and insights on public policy. We hope that you've enjoyed this episode. Please share your favorite Hub podcast with friends and family and subscribe wherever you get your audio online. We also appreciate your ratings and reviews. I'm the Hub's Executive Director, Rudyard Griffiths. This program was produced and edited by Amal Atar Guzman. The Hub podcasts are generously supported by the Ira Gluskin and Maxine Granovsky Gluskin Charitable Foundation and the Linda Frum and Howard Sokolowski Charitable Foundation. Thanks for listening.